All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the October 19th meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. It's always a reminder of why we love New England on days like today with the leaves just popping, maybe a little past peak, but that's okay. What a beautiful day. As always with these meetings, we start off with general public comment. So if any folks out there, any of the folks out there would like to comment on anything CPC related, if you could raise your hands and you may do so at this time. I see one, Claudia. Hi, sorry, let me finish chewing my food. <laughs> Hi, Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. I just wanted to make a few comments about the process that has just gone down about St. John Cantius and say it was a long and difficult process. And I found it, I found it was, it was complicated a bit by the fact that you, Brian, kept showing up at meetings and, and saying that this wasn't a housing issue and how much the CPC committee was behind the decision. And having you know watched the meetings, I mean, I realize it's been a very complicated decision and that people were very tormented by the decision. So the fact, so when you kept showing up, it just seemed to push, push, push on this idea that you were that the committee was not you personally behind this and I and I had a bit of a problem with that but having said that I think that the whole controversy has been really positive because I think now people realize there is this money a lot of money in the city that's available to citizens but I think the problem is that we don't actually know how do we begin to access it so I'm I'm coming to the comment session tonight to ask, could CPC publicize when the debt publicize when funding periods are opening and closing? Is it possible to hold a meeting like the ARPA just did? So people so it explains who's eligible, how do you apply, what are your chances, what how do you define it? What can a, can a person apply? Can a neighborhood apply? What will we do now um, that we've been provoked in a positive way by these ideas and seeing what, how we could use this money you know, to improve our neighborhood? So I'm, I'm asking for more outreach, more clarity and more publicity around the process because you know, clearly the money is important and that there are a lot, a lot of things in the in the city that need attention that this money could be used for. So um, I'll wind down and say, I'm hoping to see in the future a lot more public um, uh, invitation to participate and explanation of how to do it. It would be great, even if you don't do every funding period, to now that everybody's really alerted to this money, if you might do at least one public forum to explain how you get the money, who is eligible, and so forth and so on. So that's my comment for tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, any other comments from folks out there? Any other hands raised? No? Okay, let's move on. Uh, we have just a few items to attend to before we get to meeting with the applicants. And that's the main focus of our meeting tonight is to have tier five of the applicants um, make their proposals to us. First, we have minutes to approve. Um, we tried to do this last time. I think we lacked a quorum or something. I can't quite remember, but there are minutes that were sent to us for March 16th. Sarah reminded us that we're able to vote on minutes even if we aren't at the meeting. Is that correct, Sarah? Uh, you can vote to move the minutes forward. It is, yeah. You know, sometimes there's turnover in a committee and it, it wouldn't be possible to accept them into the record otherwise. So people are comfortable voting even though they weren't there. That's perfectly acceptable. Great, good, thank you. So is there a motion to approve the minutes of March the 16th? Moved. Uh, thank you, Julia. A second? Second. Okay. Sarah? All right. So forgive me if I'm missing anyone on the CPC. I've been going through trying to grab everyone. Um, 
Jana? Yes. Julia? Yes. Jen? Yes. Brian? Yes. Bev? Yes. And Jonah? Yes. And did I miss anybody? Chris, yes. Chris, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Good. Thank you. So uh, meeting, the minutes have been approved and maybe other minutes could be sent along for us at the next meeting, Sarah. Uh, next comes chair's report, and I have a few items to attend to. First and most important is that we welcome two new members to the CPC tonight. Uh, so welcome, 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 Bev Bates. She is the mayoral appointment and Jonah Zuckerman, who just recently, the last city council meeting was appointed to fill the vacant uh, slot left by Dan. So while we mourn both Dan and Linda's, I was gonna say passing, but that's not what it is. While we mourn they're, they're leaving the CPC, we are certainly looking forward to having, uh, Beverly, is it is it Bev? Do we call you Bev or Beverly? Please, Bev. Bev, okay, great. And uh, and, jo and Jonah joining us. And it's nice you're coming on now because it's the start of the, of, of the session. And and, uh, and again, for both of you, if uh, there's anything that you're confused about, please speak up at the meeting or contact Sarah or uh, or myself if there's a, a, a process issue or just something that you don't quite understand what, what the, uh, what's going on. So welcome the two of you. A few other items, as I think everyone knows, or perhaps knows, is that the St. John Canius Church proposal, after a lengthy uh, debate, sometimes contentious, was passed by city council at the last city council meeting on a seven to two vote. Seven approved, uh, two uh, voted against it. Unbeknownst, at least to me, and I think to Sarah as well, it needed a super majority to pass. So it had to have at least a six to three vote on issues of fiscal interest. Um, so the seven to, seven to two uh, vote, and that has now uh, gone through. I was pleased in attending a number of the city council meetings and the finance committee meetings that uh, most people spoke very highly of our committee and the amount of work that we put into the proposal. Not everyone obviously agreed with us. It was a, it was, I know the most contentious proposal in my time with the with the CPC, um, uh, but it is been approved by City Council, and we'll wait and see how it all uh, uh, pans out. In the same meeting, the City Council, with unanimous approval, approved the uh, the the uh, Northampton Historic Northampton uh, small grant small grants for their uh, Parsons Collection storage as well as the larger expedited proposal for the Canal Greenway retaining wall. So those went through at that meeting as well with unanimous approval by city council. The last thing I wanted to mention was, and this is really good news for us and the city, is that the land grant uh, request that went in was successful for the Saul Mill Hills core acquisition project. Uh, so that's great. I think that was 400,000, Sarah, is that correct? So that's a really nice uh, chunk of change. And it's really nice that the state recognizes uh, um, all the good effort that we put into land acquisition and continue to reward us with uh, land acquisition uh, uh, monies. Um, that means the ask for that project stays at 300,000. If you, you may remember in reading the proposal, that if the land grant didn't come in, I think they're going to go all the way up to uh, was it eight hundred thousand, Sarah, or seven hundred thousand, something like that. Um, but so we're, we're we're happy to get that um, that four hundred thousand. Yeah. Um, before we get to meetings with the applicants, uh, Sarah, you wanted to or are able to give us a quick financial overview. I included it as an agenda item, mostly just in case anybody had questions, uh, but really no changes from the, the last time. Um, you know, just to, just to subtract that project that was funded for the Holly Street project, as well as the um, 
Historic Northampton Small Grant and the Canal Greenway. Uh, any questions for Sarah about finances? No. Okay, so the majority of the rest of the meeting will be spent on meeting with applicants for uh, for funds. Um, we have five applicants or applications, <coughs> excuse me, before us tonight, and we're going to meet with them in the order that Sarah sent the agenda out. So first will be Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity, the Victoria Bismarck Farm. Next will be the Northampton Community Music, the uh, Music Center for their exterior renovation. Third will be Smith Charities for emergency repairs. Fourth will be the DAR House uh, Electric Updates. And fifth will be the Community Investment Fund uh, brought to us by Pioneer Development. Uh, so here's how this works, folks. Uh, we have had a chance to read your proposal, all of us, hopefully. We have submitted written questions to you of which you responded, and we've had a chance to uh, read, those, uh, read those responses as well. After we meet with you tonight, two weeks from now, we have another meeting where we'll hear another five uh, applications out there. Public comment will be on, on the meeting uh, scheduled for November the 16th. That's a Wednesday, seven o'clock meeting. It's a Zoom meeting. We encourage you to uh, have your supporters speak out if they are so inclined at that meeting. Um, that's pretty much all we do at that meeting is listen to public comment. Um, so again, if you'll put that in your notebooks, November 16th, and again, uh, it's, it's always good to hear uh, uh, folks speaking out on uh, on proposals. Um, even though we've had a chance to look at your proposals, to read your proposals, to look at the questions, it's still nice to get a brief overview on your part uh, so you can jog our memory or memories, refresh our memories about, um, about your projects. Uh, and then we will open it up to questions from committee members um, to you. Uh, again, no decisions are made uh, tonight. Uh, we wait until after meeting with all the uh, all the um, folks who have submitted proposals. We wait till after the public comment. And uh, as it stands now, we will discuss and hopefully complete recommendations in our December seventh meeting. So it's a it's a little bit uh, down the road a bit. Also. Uh, applicants do remember that we are the advising body for city council. In other words, um, we can recommend or not recommend, but ultimately it is city council that appropriates funds for projects. Uh, and uh, um, so once we make a decision on which projects to move forward in our December 7th uh, meeting, then it goes on to city council. And hopefully, Sarah, that can be done in December, right? So that by the end of the year, you will you will know uh, the status of your proposals. So while we, we're not gonna apologize for it taking so long, that's just how the process, the process works. So without further ado, we're gonna start with uh, Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity, the Victoria Bismarck Farm Project. You are up. Hi, thank you, Brian. I'm Megan McDonough, the Executive Director of Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity. Um, is it all right if I share screen? Is that allowed? All right, absolutely, should be all set. Okay, great. Um, well, I wanted to introduce Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity, although the CPC and the city of Northampton has been a significant supporter of ours. So most of you are already familiar with us. But we are a nonprofit organization that builds homes in Hampshire and Franklin counties in order to build uh, self-reliance, strength, and stability through affordable home ownership. We're an affiliate of Habitat for Humanity International, but we're our own independent local nonprofit organization. Um, we focus, we think all housing uh, is important and there's great needs for rental housing, but our particular focus is on home ownership. 
And there's been a lot of benefits to home ownership, increasing people's education, good health, net family wealth, which gets into uh, racial disparities in equity building. It helps prevent problems with um, health and being in substandard housing. And I'm not going to dwell too much on that, but um, since 1989, we've built 50 homes in Hampshire and Franklin counties, and uh, 23 of those have been in the city of Northampton. And that is really due to the city's strong support for affordable mm -hmm. housing and the creative work of the planning department to provide land for new projects. We build not just uh, with staff and paid contractors, but we build with the community that we live in. Uh, we build with future homeowners. They do sweat equity in the construction alongside hundreds of community members who volunteer on each and every project. And they, you know, who are our homeowners? They are people who live in the, our neighborhoods already, but can't take that next step towards affordable home ownership and that stability that it provides. They have to provide in a lengthy application process where they demonstrate a housing need, that they have the ability to pay an affordable mortgage, and that their willingness to partner uh, with Habitat exists. And that's demonstrated through that sweat equity and putting in a significant chunk of time to help build their own homes. A lot of our homeowners are single parents. I think that makes common sense to anyone who thinks about trying to purchase a home on a single income. Um, a lot of them are parents, but we do we have sold a house to a single individual, a one bedroom house, as well as to large families in, in larger homes. Our homeowners come from a variety of uh, application of professions. Um, when we looked at applications, it was across the board from artists to self-employed to uh, doing manual labor, military, nonprofit, all over the map. And I think more importantly, um, it's just the deep impact it makes on these home, future homeowners. And to quote a few of them, uh, uh, homeowner Hamid said, for me, this is life-changing. It is a dream I never would have thought would come true. Uh, Patrick, who's building his house right now in Northampton said, you always have a dream for what your life could be. And I thank all the great people involved at Habitat for Humanity who enrich our lives and made our dreams come true. Tiffany, sometimes I feel like I'm living in a dream. I think that this, this theme of the word dream is really because it seems so out of reach for some people to be able to have a home of their own where they can put down roots and not have to worry about the landlord deciding to raise the rent or sell the house and then have to scramble to find something new. Many of the homeowners, uh, the renters in our region are cost burdened and Habitat provides a unique opportunity to purchase a home. Um, so that's the general habitat background, but I'm here to talk to you about three houses we plan to build on Burt's Pit Road and a project we're calling Victoria Bismarck Farm. Uh, it, this is not to be confused with the other three houses on Burt's Pit Road that are currently under construction that the CPC has already um, made an award to contribute towards that construction. This property 278 Burt's Pit Road is um, closer to the Northampton Community Gardens. It's um, actually on a property that used to be part of the state hospital, but it's it's not the, the main um, campus of the state hospital is over here, but this project is down closer to the Smith Vocational Agricultural Fields. Um, and looking across those fields, you can see the Hampshire County Jail to the south. Um, there previously was a farmhouse on this property uh, that the next door neighbor who currently lives there, she's in her 90s and it was her grandfather. Her grandfather used to live in this house and told us that the neighborhood uh, was called Victoria Bismarck. And that this, she, um, one of the neighbors gave us this picture of a sign that was in the house. So we just, that's where the name for the project came from. 
this house used to be associated, I think, with some of the land that's now being used by Smith Vocational for Agriculture. The parcel that we uh, own and that has was given to us by the city of Northampton is heavily wooded. Um, so there we're, we're beginning to start removal of trees this fall, we hope. Um, the overall parcel that we received from the city was divided into three building lots. Two of them are smaller and then one large building lot here. The reason this one is a little bit larger is there are some wetlands down in this um, southwest corner. So we're trying to create a buffer to that. This dark line represents uh, the limit of construction work. So we're also clustering the houses to have less of an impact on the landscape. Uh, the bigger rectangle is gonna be a one story house. So it has a little bigger of a footprint. And then there'll be two one two story houses. So all three will be three bedroom homes, but the one story house could be adapted for someone in a wheelchair. Um, each home will have its own driveway and is on its own building lot. So it's not a condo association, it's three single family home opportunities. We're gonna begin family selection in January of 2023. And the maximum selling price for each of these houses will be $200,000. Um, when we sell a home, we always make sure that the buyer won't be spending more than 30% of their income on housing at the time of the sale. Whether we have to adjust second mortgages or the selling price to make that happen, we put together a financial package that ensures that if they met our eligibility criteria, that they have the willingness to partner, they have the ability to pay demonstrated through their credit and meeting a minimum income, they have a housing need, so they're under 60% area median income, can't afford a home ownership in this area, then we'll enter them in a lottery and select applicants for the three houses that way. Um, we have asked for more money from, from the CPC this year than we have for our previous projects. And that is um, in part because construction costs are going up. Um, this is our sources and uses budget that was in our application to the committee. Um, it shows us requesting $60,000 per house for a total of $180,000. Um, we also submitted a grant to the Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston, and we'll hear back whether that's funded in December as well. Um, we have been um, working on building all electric homes to meet um, higher rebate levels from the Mass Save program that started this year uh, because we really focus on energy efficiency. We've also got a partnership with a local solar installer who's willing to install a uh, to fill the roof with PV for a cost of 7,500 per house. So that's well below the actual cost of installation. Um, this other fundraising category means we're gonna have to go out and get dollars um, through community donations to make up the rest of the uh, package. We only ask our homeowners to make a $700 down payment for each of their houses. But we do plan to sell them the house with uh, a first mortgage that's significantly less than that $200,000 I just mentioned. But if a local bank gives a first mortgage, it gives us some more cash at closing. And then Habitat will provide a deferred forgivable loan to make up the difference between the purchase price um, and the bank, what they can afford in a monthly payment to a bank. So that's a little bit on the revenue side. Um, when I, we were looking recently at, um, you know, I think if we go back here, you'll see there's, uh, we put in a construction contingency, um, the direct construction costs and the builder general requirements, these two line items together are what I'm gonna show on the next slide. And I think that actually in my response to the CPC committee, I did not add the general requirements in my comparison. So it was a little bit, not exactly apples to apples. So I updated those numbers here. Um, back in 2015 to 2018, we were able to average about $108,000 by getting in-kind donations, discounted materials, um, 
for those direct cash construction costs uh, for the construction and the general requirements. Um, that the average for between 2020 and 2022 went up to 185,000. Um, in part because one of our most expensive projects was when we experimented with doing modular construction. It actually cost us more because we save money on carpentry labor through volunteers. Um, so having that done at a factory and the added complications of working with another entity made that more expensive. But if we take out the modulars, still costs have gone up significantly since our pre-pandemic construction costs. Um, for Victoria Bismarck Farm, we have um, anticipated that costs will continue to go up. It's a little bit hard to know. Um, we're very grateful for the contributions that we receive from the community, working with Smith Vocational where we can to reduce costs, discount from Kohl's Lumber, discounted PV from PV Squared, um, you know, all of these things help us keep costs under control, but I think that maybe some of the other builders here would say that 200,000 for a three bedroom house is still a pretty remarkable build price, um, but it's a significant increase for us from where we used to be. So that's kind of the big picture, and I wanted to allow you guys to ask questions and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Megan. Uh, questions for Megan? Committee members, questions? Uh, we're gonna stick to committee members for this, uh, Claudia. This is the time where um, we're not open to public comment at this point that we're keeping our comments from and questions from committee members. So no questions from the public. Not at this point, no. That will come under the public comment, which will be what we say, uh, November the 16th. That that's the meeting reserved for public comment. Okay. Uh, any committee members questions? Um, Megan, I'm still amazed at that $203,000 per unit cost. And given just the outrageous increases in, in construction, is, is that, you haven't gone out to bid yet for the project, is that true? Or if you have, do you think you can it is stick to that 203,000? It is based on estimates, but that 203,000 for the direct correct construction costs, not including soft costs, like attorneys done closing costs, things like that, um, is, I think we can stick to that. I mean, it is higher than what we did on our last build. We just finished in Pelham. So I feel pretty confident that we've added in a buffer to account for some of the variability. Um, we're also trying a couple of new things. We're working with the local energy advocates on our domestic hot water um, so that we can try a, a new heat pump hot water heater that's a split um, system that's more expensive. So trying that adds a little bit to our overall cost versus just doing a basic um, tank water heater. Great, thank you. Uh, Beth? Uh, hi, Megan, I'm new to this and um, not terribly due to Habitat, but nice nice to meet you. Um, I want to echo the uh, amazement that I feel that you're able to build such quality at such a price. So uh, what is your biggest concern at this stage in your process? What are, what are the things that can go wrong other than world calamity? <laughs> Yeah, pandemic 2.0 is always a concern now. Um, but yeah, um, we um, this site is heavily wooded, so we do need to remove a fair number of trees. That's um, we're trying to get Smith Vocational Forestry out there so that they can um, get some of those trees down for us. Um, which, because otherwise, it's it's thousands and thousands of dollars to remove some of those really large trees. Um, and uh, we also you know, 
when I look at our project budgets, um, site work is one of our more expensive uh, construction costs. There's just kind of no way around that. Um, if we, you know, excavators don't really donate their time. I haven't found anyone willing to yet, but uh, the uh, that's usually one of the biggest ticket items. Um, I don't see any concerns about feasibility. I mean, we've we've built 50 homes using this model. Um, we were able to continue through the pandemic um, with only sort of a brief pause to say, hey, hey what are we doing here? Um, and right now we have three homes under construction on Birds Pit Road in Northampton. So I think we have a strong track record in the city. Thank you. Any other questions for Megan? Uh, Jeff? Um, hi, Megan. Um, what those houses on Burt Pitts Road, <clears throat> um, what's it, how, I drive by that every day. How, how fast is that progressing? And the second part is, <clears throat> um, do you, foresee the possibility that instead of three houses, you might just have to build one or two and then wait on the third, or I suppose that's similar to a couple of the other comments. Um, I do find um, 200,000 ballpark figure quite remarkable. I guess I have to echo that. Yeah, it really, that's the, that's basically a net figure after in-kind donations. And I think that's the important thing to remember when comparing it to other um, projects. It's not, um, uh, it's, I'm not adding on the in-kind or the value of the carpentry labor that happens through community volunteers. So, it, you know, it would cost more if I, we had to pay for those things. Um, the three houses um, we're calling Broughton's Meadow Homes um, down closer to Emerson Way on Burt's Pit Road. Um, those are going well. The Smith Vocational Carpentry students are taking the lead on framing one of those houses. Um, and Smooth Vocational Plumbing and Electrical are doing the plumbing and electrical for all three, which is great. They uh, have all been there this week working away. And we have volunteers doing the general carpentry and construction for two of the houses. Usually it takes us about a year uh, to build a house. And I think they're on track to getting them closed in. We had a moment where we thought we weren't gonna get the windows for a few mo months, but um, something changed. They called again, they, they got the, the windows are coming in a couple of weeks. So we'll be able to get it closed in. Um, the uh, there's, those houses are pretty small, so I still feel like it'll be spring, summer next year that they'll be complete. Okay. Um, in terms of Victoria Bismarck, what we would like to do is start with trees this fall and this winter and um, apply for the building permits uh, in the early spring winter so that we can start construction in the spring. It's it's what's next on our docket, basically to move from the one side on Birch Pit Road to this one. Um, and we're managing four houses under construction right now. We also have a house under construction in Conway. So I think that we can um, get these three built starting next year in 2024, 2023 to be completed in 2024. Thank you. Any other questions for Megan? Well, thank you so much, Megan. Again, uh, public comments are November 16th, so you can uh, get the word out about that. And uh, and good luck with the projects that are ongoing on Burt's Pit, uh, Pit Road. You're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, or you're welcome to not. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for your support, and uh, I'll see you guys on the 16th. Have okay, a wonderful day. You. Uh, next up is the Northampton Community Music uh, Center on their exterior reno uh, uh, renovation stuff. I believe, Jason, you will be speaking uh, for that. Welcome, Jason. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. 
uh, to present this project to you. I'm going to share my screen as well. So uh, the Northampton Community Music Center uh, is located at 139 South Street in Northampton. Uh, the building is uh, the former South Street School, uh, which was built in 1890 and uh, closed in the early 1980s and was um, not utilized again until NCMC um, arranged uh, for a lease with the city of Northampton uh, of a dollar a year uh, in exchange for fundraising to get the building up to code and uh, for occupancy. And at that time, we had a two-phase renovation campaign to uh, renovate um, the interior, first the first floor, and then the second floor of the building. Um, about uh, 10 years ago, we completed renovations to the lower level um, to, uh, so we're now utilizing three floors of this building um, for educational purposes. Um, a little bit about our organization, if you're unfamiliar, we were founded in 1986. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. We employ uh, right now 49 uh, professional music teachers. Um, over the course of our 36 years, we've uh, taught more than 20,000 students um, from the region. Uh, we uh, average between 700 and 850 students per year that we serve. And uh, one of the things we pride ourselves on since uh, uh, we were first founded is that we have a vibrant scholarship fund uh, that provides uh, scholarships to 100% of all of the qual qualifying students um, uh, who apply. And uh, we've been able to um, uh, sustain that for our entire 36 years. Our um, organization offers private lessons, uh, classes, and ensemble opportunities, as well as doing outreach in partnership with other nonprofit organizations. Uh, we've um, worked with social service agencies, local uh, Northampton nursing homes, doing projects there. Um, and uh, we offer workshops um, that um, bring in uh, pretty prominent names uh, to work with local musicians, also bring musicians in from out of town um, and out of state uh, to be part of those world-class concerts. Um, uh, and uh, all uh, keeping in mind accessibility uh, at the core of everything. Uh, so as I said, we leased, um, we started um, plans uh, for the building. Uh, I'm accompanied today by uh, Roger Cooney and Jonathan Wright from Wright Builders. They were there from the very beginning <laughs> and know uh, the property as intimately as uh, I do. Um, they starting in 1997 um, with the plans for the renovations. We leased this property until 2019 when we purchased the property from the city of Northampton. We had a capital campaign that raised the money to purchase the building and we mortgaged um, uh, the, the rest with UMass Five College Federal Credit Union and uh, just last year, an anonymous donor uh, contributed the money to pay off our mortgage in full, uh, $200,000. So we no longer have a mortgage. We own the property outright. Uh, since uh, we first took occupancy in 1998, we've um, invested more than $1.5 million in the restoration and renovation of the property. Um, we've mostly concentrated on um, uh, the interior of the building uh, so that we could expand our programming and uh, make use of all of the space here uh, to meet the needs of the community. Uh, we have uh, replaced our roof and rebuilt our parking lot 
during that period of time. Um, but this particular project we're going into now is addressing a lot of the exterior things that have not been done yet. Uh, the interior of the building now houses 15 teaching studios, uh, two recital halls and a recording studio. Uh, we are outfitting a music library uh, that's available to the public and our students. And um, we also have a keyboard lab as well. Uh, this picture that you're looking at right here is our main recital hall called Founders Hall. And you can see a Suzuki group class happening in there. So um, Wright Builders uh, will, of course, be managing this project uh, in addition to them intimately knowing every nook and cranny of the property. Uh, they um, have been um, real supporters of the organization and um, have been able to manage to get very um, uh, aggressive, um, aggressively low bids in order for us to get um, our work done over the years um, at very at, for a very good price. Um, the main areas of restoration for the current project that we're seeking funding for are uh, a replacement of all of the windows. Um, the windows, um, I'll, I'll be going through each of these um, in, in future panels. Uh, the windows and the trim around the windows, which um, need repointing and repainting. Uh, the exterior doors of um, uh, there are north and south. I'll, I'll, I'll go through the details in a little while um, of which doors we're talking about. The masonry in certain areas, um, we need re need repointing, and um, you'll see those areas in the panels. Uh, the, the trim underneath the roof line uh, is um, a particular um, important project. Right now, we actually had, um, during the pandemic, um, uh, some animals chew their way through it. <laughs> um, the the uh, areas of, of wood rot and stuff made it actually possible for animals to chew their way through. So we had to do some patch jobs just to um, remedy that situation. But uh, it brought a lot to our attention that needs to be addressed. And um, the porch structures that you see right here, um, uh, there's one on this side and there's one you can't see on the other side of the face of the building. And both of those porch, porch structures are part of um, this project. Um, part of the project we're working with Wright Builders on that we're not requesting funding for from the CPA is um, an entrance vestibule that would be in this area here. As you can see, are the main entrance that we use to the building right here. Um, uh, uh, people go directly in and out of. And um, this is the entrance driveway. Um, so for, for uh, the purposes of safety, um, some accessibility issues, we want to in install this vestibule here. Uh, that's enclosed in glass uh, with a, a door leading in that's not direct into traffic, um, but to the side here, and that has handicapped accessible buttons that will open the doors uh, for those who need it. Uh, but again, that's not part of the, the project that we're looking you to, uh, for you to fund. All right, so the first area is the windows and the trim. Um, this is a, a picture of uh, of what we're talking about. The windows that are currently in <clears throat> were donated to the Music Center um, in 1998 uh, when we first took occupancy. They were donated from another property. Um, they weren't brand new at the time. Uh, they're, they're actually double pane windows. I had um, made the mistake of writing single pane, but actually they're double pane uh, vinyl windows. <clears throat> I had misunderstood something I'd read, but um, uh, many of them are not properly fitting anymore with uh, settling in the building. There's cracks in a lot of the glass. Um, some of them don't close completely, um, and those will be replaced with uh, triple pane, historic qualifying, energy efficient uh, windows. 
And as you can see, um, the uh, trim around the windows needs to be uh, restored um, with, it needs to be scraped and painted with lead safe paint. And uh, that's part of the project as well. The exterior doors that we're uh, speaking of, uh, there's two doors <clears throat> on one on each of the porches. Uh, this is one that you're looking at in the upper right corner here. Um, these are uh, original doors. <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, um, these will be replaced uh, replicating the original panel of these doors and and the transom. Um, but with properly fitting and working doors. Um, these don't function very well. We only use them in an emergency. <laughs> um, and um, they're, they're uh, um, both going to be replaced. Um, these other doors that you're looking at, the one that you look at you're looking at on the left, these there's a set of these on the north and south side of the building. Um, that are exactly the same on each side. And um, these are also originals. The picture on the bottom right that you're looking at is the inside of that door. And you can sort of see how it's cracked um, vertically. Um, and uh, there's places where you can see daylight coming in. And at the bottom, um, it's all rotten here uh, to the point at which moisture gets in. Um, uh, it's all rotted along the bottom here. So uh, these doors will be replaced um, uh, as well with um, with doors. I'll, exp I'll, uh, I'll have, if you want details on that, I know it's in the proposal, but at the end of my presentation, I'm going to invite Jonathan and Roger to answer some of your questions if you have specific questions about what's going to be there. And then the last thing is um, we're going to restore the main mahogany door that we've been using as a main entrance um, as well. Um, the masonry, we um, when we uh, in the 2019 had to replace some downspouts and such, we had done some um, uh, patchwork on masonry in the areas where the water was leaking. But as you can see, there's areas of the masonry that needs to be repointed very badly and recleaned and everything. And um, uh, as you can see, um, there's some beautiful um, uh, uh, decorative uh, masonry as well that's going to be cleaned off and restored. Uh, the roof trim that I was telling you about, this is sort of the underside where, uh, where we're talking about. There are uh, vents that come out here and this area under the roof line around the entire perimeter of the building um, has a lot of wood rot. And uh, so those would be pulled out and replaced. Um, and uh, these are the two porch structures. Um, this uh, one on the left is on the south side of the building and the one on the right is on the north side of the building, just around the corner from the main entrance. And um, uh, if, uh, if you're in front of it, you can sort of see that uh, the uh, structure of these porches needs stabilization. Um, you can even kind of see how it's, it sags a bit and um, uh, isn't uh, in perfect vertical alignment. And um, right builders can speak to you how they're going to do it. This is beyond my purview, but there's all sorts of technical terms um, about what they plan to do. Um, to reinforce and uh, restore these porches. Um, so that's the overview of the different areas of the grant. Um, our plans going forward, uh, this was actually the first um, grant application that we've done in this process. We are hoping to do this project uh, from June to September of next year, 2023. And uh, we, we know the other um, re, uh, sources of funding that we're going to be going to. They just, their grant cycles came after yours. Uh, so uh, the very next one is actually the Cultural Facilities Fund from the Mass Cultural Council. Um, we'll be, you know, uh, seeking some matching funding uh, for things that um, we're looking from the CPC for support from, but in addition to cover some of these other areas that we're not asking the CPC to fund. Um, 
will be uh we're all, we also have the amelia peabody foundation and beverage family foundations who have helped us with renovation projects in the past um uh much smaller amounts of money are available there but uh, enough to help us uh get over the finish line with this project um so that is my presentation i'm gonna open it up for your questions and invite Jonathan and Roger in to help answer your questions. Thank you. Julia? Could you talk a little bit more? You, uh, I didn't see anything about public access in your grant application, and then you mentioned that the music library would have public access. Can you talk a little bit more beyond the private lessons and some of the other elements, yeah. how there might be some? Sure, public... absolutely. Um, so in addition to the programming you might expect from us, um, uh, the educational component, we actually, um, uh, are open to the public for a number of things. Um, we um, invite people to rent our spaces for the use of rehearsing, um, uh, whether it's individual musicians or um, uh, ensemble groups, uh, they will rent space at our uh, place to rehearse. Um, we have uh, a couple of uh, other nonprofit organizations who rent space regularly. From the music center pioneer valley capella is an example of a nonprofit organization that rents space here weekly um and we provide low you know low rental um opportunities for them we've offered uh space to um learning groups uh, uh some homeschooling groups that needed space in the mornings for group activities uh we've made space available for them during the mornings uh, Hampshire Music Club just had a concert here this morning that was beautiful, um, and uh, as an, another example, so we try to work with uh, local agencies that need space uh, for different purposes. The music library is uh, sort of the culmination of um, people with wonderful music, uh, uh, you know, sheet music libraries um, that either it, it's come from great musicians in our region who have passed on and uh, have donated um, their great music libraries. Most of the books that we're talking about are fantastic editions of things that are out of print. So we have volunteers who are helping organize all of that into areas of the music center and um, people who want to work on certain pieces can come in and borrow those books um, uh, to to work on on things that are out of print and um, uh, so, you know, we, we try to be a resource, um, you know, sort of outside the scope of what people would expect us to do. Um, and uh, I hope that answers your question. Other questions for Jason or Wright Builders? Uh, I have a question, and this may be directed to Sarah as much as anyone else. I always get confused with historic preservation of what constitutes preservation and what is allowable with, C with CPC funds, particularly with if you're replacing exterior doors, you're not restoring them or renovating them, you're actually replacing them. Is that Are, are those all eligible? Roger can probably add to it also, but um, with this type of historic preservation, it you know it's not a, a straight preservation project because so much of the building is not original, like the windows and a lot of other components. So it's it's a rehabilitation project. So all work does need to comply with the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation, but there there's not that strict one to one you know replace an original window with an original window or don't replace it at all, just do the repair. Uh, so there's a little bit more flexibility there. Uh, and with CPA, the um, the threshold also is that uh, funding can't be used for anything that's maintenance. So it should be adding to the value of the building. So like paint, painting, for example, would, is not an eligible CPA activity unless it's part of a larger project, like uh, redoing the 
um, the windows and the necessary painting around it would be eligible here. So as far as you can tell, Sarah, all of the requested funds are eligible for CPC money. Uh, it, it looked to be that way. I mean, if this was something that the CPC did decide to recommend to fund, um, it would be worth requiring that someone with expertise be able to opine that that's the case for everything that's getting done. And who would that someone be? Um, the Wright Builders probably has somebody on staff that can do that. Like Roger, I don't know if you have expertise. I'm guessing you do. I don't have a We're, We've been mindful of uh, what's there. And just to kind of talk about the parts and pieces, you know, the windows are not original to the building. Um, we're actually coming back to what a window is more representative of what was in the building before uh, MC decided to acquire it. Um, and there'll be an improvement over what's there. Um, so there'll be, and this is, a, so I want to be careful with the use of this word. They'll be historically in parens accurate. It's not, it's not strict sort of what you imagine at a federal level in terms of you have to replicate exactly in kind what is there, or you have to take what is there and you have to restore in total what is there. That's not a requirement of, of this grant as we understand. So, but we have nonetheless, in the spirit of that, um, followed what, historical data we had in terms of photographs, colors, those sorts of things. So that's all taken into consideration in, in this uh, request and the proposal for the work that we that we will perform. Um, along that same vein, there's a there's one particular door that has divided light. If, if you know what that means, it's it's the sort of divisions that have smaller pieces of glass around the perimeter. Jason had a picture of it. We we actually found a door that amazingly replicates that. So it'll be brand new, but it'll look exactly or nearly exactly like what is there already. And those pairs of doors that are sort of a, a double acting door, they're on the south and north elevation that are failing and cracked and, you know, water's infiltrating and so on. We're actually departing from that look and putting in uh, a non-wood door that will look like wood and receive paint like wood um, actually will operate better, it will be uh, thermally better, it will be air sealed better than what's there. But we think uh, with the transoms, it's it's period appropriate to what one you know would expect. Um, and uh, and so from the curb and from close up, it's it's going to look like what everyone's familiar with, and uh, it's all those marks. That uh, hopefully that that helps. Uh, that a little bit more. Thank you, Roger. Other questions for Jason or Roger or Jonathan? Jonathan? If I could, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, the building is, you know, dear to our hearts and, and, and uh, the location and the building itself are remarkable in that it was built in a time when uh, uh, public spending was not lavish. So it was well built in a compact and durable form. I and mean, all of us have looked around the city of Northampton at the Baptist church and other places and wondered how those places have survived. So it's a, it's a very solid uh, place. Uh, that said, Roger talked about the two east doors and those are barely functional and uh, converting them to something other than single glass and uh, many, many mending plates and, and uh, plywood straps and so on, so that they are new doors that do that is a, is a, a huge improvement and provides uh, safe access for you know a 50 year service life minimal. The north and south doors, those are currently pairs of doors. And when we replace, we need to be mindful of uh, egress codes. And those are, those are egress doors. And so they're being replaced at the three foot size rather than a pair of two foot doors. And um, so that's a, a code upgrade. Otherwise the appearance is you know very much the same. Um, on the on the windows, uh, we did we did uh, acquire the replacements at the initial renovation. They are six over six lights, which is not what was ever there. Um, and what was there in the in the 
the windows that we can best discern is one over one in a dark color. And but our, our conversations and research around the neighborhood, no one remembers anything other than something similar to what is there today. So our suggestion is that the windows and doors, the windows on, on the building uh, are, and the trim get painted out in the way that is familiar in this time. You know, this is always a question in historic uh, applications is like, which window does one look to? So, uh, there'll be single lights and then they'll, they'll be at the R5 uh, uh, performance level, which is about a 50% reduction in heat loss from the current windows, which were a 50% reduction from what was there when the city turned it over to the, to the music center. But those are now deteriorated. They were really too big for that application. So that's a long answer. Um, uh, sorry for the narrative, but um, you know, if, if it's useful to you, uh, much appreciated. Bev, uh, gotta unmute yourself, Bev. Uh, yeah, it occurs to me that um, uh, it's an unfortunate time of the year to be kicking all this work down to spring. Um, I take it there's some kind of plan for keeping the building reasonably tight during the winter. You don't have to elaborate on that, but. Related to that question is what happens if the other funding doesn't come in? Um, I, I'm really not expecting that to happen. Um, this this isn't our first Optimism. round uh, of doing this, um, and uh, you know everything that we've done, the the support has been um, uh, there for us um, from the same sources that we're going to now and. Um, I've already uh, uh, submitted an intent to apply for the MCC Cultural Facilities Fund. Uh, I've spoken uh, to people there. I think that's a very reasonable um, uh, matching grant that we're going to be getting there. And um, we've never made a request um, for for this kind of work from the other resources and not gotten it. <laughs> so um, I, I think the support is there. I'm, I'm very confident that we're gonna get over the finish line with this. Um, I, I don't think we'll fall short, but um, should should we get there, it would be a conversation we have with right builders about what are the priorities? <laughs> you know, it always comes down to like, you know, uh, these are all of the things that, that need to be addressed um, and uh, we're gonna do our best to get there. Um, and I will just keep pounding the payment for funding. Um, until it gets gets done. Great, I like optimism. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, uh, Jonathan? Ken? I, I just might add because that was a really good question, the what if question, and thank you for that. So when when as we've worked with, but my wife is a musician, so I I come with the package, you know. Uh, uh, and and uh, it's been a remarkable experience for the last thirty years. But I, I can offer up that uh, in, in conversations uh, with Jason and Mass Cultural Facilities, they've asked us to consult with other nonprofits about how to develop a long-term maintenance plan. One of the things that they wanted and which we've worked to, get to provide for them is a, a really a longer horizon, not the help, the water's coming in, but what is going to need to happen over. And, and uh, so working with Jason, we've provided a 10, 20 and 30 year maintenance and and uh, and replacement plan, which is why we're coming upon these windows before they're falling out of the building. So uh, it's not often that we get to sort of, you know, step slightly ahead of the curve and slightly ahead of the rising water, um, but that's what's happening here. And, you know, it, it's uh, something that we're honored to be able to help with because of the, the, the value, but that's, that's how we, that's kind of how we, we got there and mass cultural facilities is responsive to that because they they like um, uh, planned work rather than emergencies, you know, on, on the average. So, yeah, thank you. Any other questions? I had, I had one of the com comment, Ryan, and, and, and while it wasn't expressed specifically for this project, uh, you're all wondering, you know, construction and construction costs and so on. Um, and I, I 
we've seen you know astronomical changes over two two years ago. But I think the good news is is that um, you know things are calming down somewhat. But relative to the budgeting that we did on this project, and you know, I know Megan this as well and with hers, you know we we've taken into consideration and have built in what we expect will be some increases um, coming into 2023. And, you know, the other piece about this is that, you know, we, we, we have friendly competition, um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of angels out there who, uh, and, and, I, and I mean that in terms of some of the contractors that we, we align ourselves with, really uh, understand the importance of these types of projects and are supportive of, and they, they go to the well, they help. And, uh, and we ask for that. and. And uh, we often are, you know, receive that. We're grateful for that. So, uh, want to sort of throw, put that, sort of put that in the rock tumbler for you all. It's, we all worry about it <laughs> on a regular basis. Um, and I'll do our level best to uh, stretch, stretch those dollars. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, and again, the public comments uh, session is uh, on Zoom on November the 16th at seven o'clock. So you can encourage supporters to show up and uh, speak, their, speak their minds about that. Thank you all three of you for joining us. You're welcome to stay. Otherwise, we'll move along to Smith Charities, uh, a second proposal for them, uh, the emergency repairs uh, at Smith Charities. So who will be speaking for that? Uh, I'll be speaking second and uh, Mimi's gonna kick us off. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone. Um, I wanna just begin by saying thank you to all of you who do this work because it's very important. Um, makes me proud to be a citizen of Northampton just knowing that we even have the community preservation. Just a little quick blurb. My father-in-law was a master carpenter whose specialty was in um, doing restoration work where you wouldn't know that restoration work had occurred. So it's these kinds of things are close to my heart about doing <laughs> historical preservation and things like that. He passed away in 2015, but there was a historical home that he worked on in um, multiples in Connecticut, but one that was just recently they dedicated a space to him and my mother-in-law. So I just I'm prefacing all of that by acknowledging that how important this kind of work is um, for everything. Uh, the building that we are talking about today is uh, in Northampton. It is next to the Silverscape Designs building. You have probably passed it a million times and not noticed it because it's quite non-descript. <laughs> and um, unless you know what you're looking for, you don't see it. But it is a beautiful building. It is a building that houses the Smith Charities. Um, I am the Northampton representative of the electors of the Smith Charities program and the Oliver Smith will. Oliver Smith um, was a person who um, used his will to create the Smith Vocational School and to set up a charity where we give funds to widows and to new brides and to tradespeople and to nurses. So it's a really fantastic program that exists that a lot of people don't even know exists in the community and it serves nine of the hill towns. Um, the building is quite beautiful, but it, it definitely needs in repair. Um, and it definitely is an historical building. Um, I'm going to defer all those things to my colleague, Carol, who is also a trustee, who is a current trustee of the um, Smith Charities because she's got all the details. But I just wanna say as a Northampton resident, um, I really truly appreciate the work that the CPC does. I'm glad that my tax dollars goes to something that does positive things. And I am very grateful for the work that every one of you are doing at 8, 10 p.m. on a Wednesday evening to be doing this kind of work. So I'm going to now pass it off to my friend, Carol. And again, thank you all for the work that you do. Thank you, Mimi. Uh, yeah, hi, nice to meet you. My name's Carol Gray and I'm a trustee with Smith Charities. And I'm gonna just share my screen and um, walk us through uh, the project. So, 
Okay, so um, our application, um, it, it's actually, I said repairs, but it's actually restoration work. And this is phase two of restoration work that has already been funded by the CPC. Um, and this is for restoration of, as Mimi said, the 1865 historic building. Um, and um, the, uh, the work is all based on a report that, uh, Actually, the report that was put together by architects and based on a study that was that was commissioned by Mass Historic, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, but here's a summary about uh, the value of the Smith Charities building for the the historic uh, downtown of Northampton. This is uh, an excerpt from the um, from the website of um, Historic Northampton, and as you can see, it discusses how. Um, oops, sorry. It discusses how uh, the architecture is unique, Victorian Renaissance style, uh, and uh, the bottom paragraph, it talks about how uh, one of the things that's unusual about the building is this is one of the, the, maybe the only building, but certainly one of the few buildings that has served the same purpose that it was built for. So Oliver Smith died in 1845, and this building was built to house Smith Charities, and it's had that same function uh, ever since. Uh, the interior has um, beautiful woodwork, and uh, part of what Smith Charity does is they also give mortgages, and that's how they fund the the uh, the grants, that, the gifts that they give to the people who Oliver Smith deemed to be the most needy. Anyway, the interior has this huge vault in the middle because it's been it, it's had the same purpose, uh, handling mortgages for for uh, centuries. Um, so. Um, uh, this is just an older picture. Uh, as uh, I mentioned, this building is part of the Northampton Downtown Historic District. Uh, so it, it's already recognized as uh, part of the uh, cert certified as uh, historic. Um, and as I mentioned before, the everything we're proposing is part of a plan that it was part of the final report. Um, you can see the cover of it on the right. And you should have this report in the materials. It's a 73 page report. And uh, it was a study that went into great detail about the exterior and the interior and uh, listed itemized all the things that were top priority uh, and that basically this is our, our plan. And so when, when we call them emergency, uh, emergency restoration, that's because Jones with set architects had, uh, had used that language. Um, and the work would be completed by Structures North. They completed phase one of the, the masonry work. Uh, and as you can see from their resume on the right, they have experience doing uh, the Massachusetts State House, Harvard Divinity School, they, uh, they're, they're some of the best stone masons that you can have and you can count for sure that they will do it historically correctly. Uh, and uh, so um, here is the, the budget that uh, Jones would set architects uh, established for phase two. Um, so the number that um, we put forward is I took from the low estimate, um, which uh, one of your questions was, how can we be sure it'll be low estimate? Well, we can't be, but uh, I was trying to be conservative in terms of our request and we'll do, we'll uh, get through whatever restoration we're able to get through, but uh, we're asking for the 399 number minus uh, what would we, we would be seeking in a grant from the Massachusetts Historic Association. And we did get a grant from them previously, um, as you'll see from the materials that I sent uh, in response to your questions, they don't give large sums. Uh, matter of fact, as a matter of fact, most of their grants were 50,000 at the most. Uh, they did give us um, a little bit surplus of that afterwards. We had originally applied for, um, for 80, but they gave 50 to everybody. But then if they have some left over at the end of the season, at the end of their funding cycle, uh, they can give a little more. So I believe they gave us 85,000 total. Um, I anticipate that the actual numbers for this, uh, for the construction work will be in the median category, maybe even to the high category. We don't know, uh, construction costs go up by the day, um, but 
uh, but we will be seeking, we'll be applying for the Mass Historic Association grant uh, in next March. Uh, and we hope that they would fund at least the 50,000. And if they would fund more, that would get us closer to the median estimate, which would allow us to uh, complete, hopefully, the, this entire phase. Um, you can see from this uh, from this itemization what the type of work is. The chimney needs to be restored, uh, the, uh, the um, roof and the flashing, the attic wall repairs, the collar ties, and I'll just show you pictures of what some of that looks like. So uh, here on the top right you can see the, the keystones above some of the windows are cracking and you know, risk falling out. Some of these are actually safety issues. You know, if if parts of the roof or parts of the stone fall down, you know, this is right on Main Street, so that could be a hazard. So uh, and you can see that some of the facade is just uh, sorry, backing up, uh, is is coming apart. The, the chimney over here is on the bottom left of the roof. Um, and uh, here are some of the uh, diagrams that have been put together by Jones with Set. By the way, Jones with Set would uh, oversee the whole project. They put together all the spe specs for um, for the people who would be doing the stone masonry work. Uh, and here they're explaining what that work uh, includes. And all of this is in the in our application. Um, so basically, there's there's separating bedding planes from the shale stones. This must be replaced. The scaling, you could see that the the parts of the the walls that are literally coming off from the brownstone, um, the splitting of the stone units need to be replaced. Um, the separating of the bedding. Here we are again. Um, and then, uh, um, so this is showing the restoration of the chimney, the structural cracks that need to be replaced. As you can see right above the keystone, you saw pictures of those keystones and how those need to be replaced. Uh, the splitting of the stone units need to be replaced. Uh, in, inside, there are, uh, I've learned that collar ties are very important. And uh, so, one explanation that uh, the architects gave, uh, since I don't, I don't know the architectural details, but they said regarding the interior work, the structural framing work in the attic is addressing a critical force issue. The downward force of the roof has been essentially pushing the exterior walls outward. The work involves installation of collar ties to uh, strengthen the key structural members and attic walls that have been separating from the floor. So basically, Part of why we want to get this work done, you know, in this phase is because it's it's continuing to deteriorate the walls, and so uh, so the longer it gets put off, the the more it could, you know, it's pushing outside on the walls. So these ties are are important. Um, redoing the chimney is important. Um, uh, in terms of this issue being restoration, the architects believe that this is all restoration work. They said uh, the proposed work addresses fundamental structural concerns in the building that was built in 1865 and has withstood significant aging and weathering that has deteriorated masonry features that allow the building to remain intact. The work will preserve the exterior masonry on the south elevation and retie the roof framing to the exterior wall. Once complete, significant masonry restoration to the roof and facade should not be needed for several decades. So um, basically, uh, it's lasted uh, close to you know, getting up to 100, no, more than 150 years. And I anticipate that by the time they restore all this uh, with materials that are even better than what they used in 1865, uh, this project will outlast our life, lifetimes. Uh, also, another reason why we're uh, seeking to keep all this package together is because some of the project, um, we're, the last phase worked on one of the uh, one of the sides. And uh, by the way, there is going to be a third phase. Uh, this is all. Uh, it's it's not cheap, and it takes takes time. Uh, the first phase is all completed, but each phase is covering a different uh, wall. And so they have to build a scaffolding. So if you can get all these things done based on what their the architects had recommended, then you build one scaffolding and you can hit all these things together. And so you don't have the, the repeated cost of building the same scaffolding in the same, uh, for the same uh, face, for the same wall. Um, 
Okay. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to close. This is not a letter from this year. This is from a couple of years ago. We wanted to thank the Mass Historical Commission and the CPC for their support in 2020. Uh, uh, the Historical Commission is not doing, they're not doing letters this year, but I just uh, have this in to just point out that they had recognized that uh, the building was significant in the history, archaeology, architecture, and culture of the city and town. Uh, so uh, we hope that it uh, continues to be uh, part of the, the bedrock historic district in the downtown, and uh, we thank you for your support in the past, and, and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Carol. Uh, questions for Carol? Anybody? Questions, questions? Uh, Chris? All right, there we go. Uh, okay, all right, so um, thank you for coming in. And um, I guess my next question, my question would be, so what's phase three? What, what assuming we can fund this and uh, you have adequate resources to complete the work um, for phase two. What what what's the next step look like? Phase three is a different side. So there's the northwest, so north, south, east, west, and so um, so phase one covered the piece that's got the the cornice on the front, um, and that was uh, one of the most difficult stone masonry restorations I was told. Uh, so this takes a different uh, wall and then the, the last part will also be the exterior and it will cover a different wall. I'm told that it uh, won't be, uh, it'll hopefully be cheaper than, than this phase, uh, but uh, it's not part of this proposal. It would, it would be too costly. Okay, so and it, is that, is that, um documentation and budget part of the 73 page report that uh, the architects prepared for you so the 73 so short answer yes but the prices are older um mm -hmm. this this report was done about five years ago uh i'd have to double i think it's like 20 18. Um, so the prices are not current. And also the report covers everything. It covers everything in the interior. It covers um, things that are repairs. Like, you know, we've handled things like the air conditioning, the, the, the plumbing is very old, the, the, the boiler needed a new pad that uh, anyway, so various things that are repairs, we, we have covered, they're not restoration and we're not bringing them to you. So everything's in that report. You, you can um, thumb through it. And, uh, and so the, the interior, we haven't proposed anything from the interior. The outside is, is uh, all the stone masonry work is really just uh, classic restoration. And, and it's what the public walks by every day. And uh, so, and it's, and it's pulling the building apart. So we need to fix it so that it, it won't continue to deteriorate. Yeah, yeah, I was just I was just looking for that that portion of the uh, the proposal. I, I I didn't find it posted on the website. Do we do we do you, you know have, if we have that, Sarah? You should. Yeah, I, I sent many, many documents, but that was one of them. OK, yeah, we, we have the full uh, historic structures report. And that, and that was funded, that study was funded through a grant from the Mass Historic Association. Okay. All right. I, I guess what I'm getting at is um, uh, when, when, uh, when we first consider doing support work for, for Smith Charities, um, uh, we had a discussion about what the long-term, you know, sort of um, plan was and how it was going to be resourced and uh the answers we got at that point in time were a little bit vague um i have to be honest with you and and um uh, to go at this incrementally um is is problematic for me i, I really i really need to feel that um I, i'm seeing the totality of what it is that we're looking at um uh, you know, I wasn't expecting to see another um, proposal. Um, doesn't mean we shouldn't we shouldn't consider it, but um, uh, knowing that we're now going to get probably a third one, um, I'd like to see this in the context of the whole thing. 
uh, with a budget that's representative, get, taking into account the fact that um, uh, you know you can't you can't project three five years where costs are going to be, but at least just you know um, some understanding of how this fits into the overall the overall scheme of what what your plan for the structure is as you move forward. So I'm going to be um, trying to dig that out at some point, um, but that's 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 where I'm at right now. If it would help, um, so when I was asking the architects, um, is this the final phase for the exterior? And they said, no, there's still another face that, that needs to be done. Actually, I think there's things on two different faces. They said it would be much cheaper. And I believe I can double check this, but I think they said it could be in the like $85,000 range. Um, uh, again, that's today's prices and yeah, um, right. but, but uh, I, I could have proposed everything. I just thought it would seem like such a big number. It, and there's some, there's other worthy projects. And, you know, I, um, the, the, the plan that they gave us, you know, this is kind of the long term, like, what do you do? You know, like if you've, you're working on your house, what do you do over the next five to 10 years to, to try to restore it? And, and um, whether or not the, we've been doing the restorations in the order of urgency. Yeah. So, um, so the things that are pushing the walls apart, we're prioritizing that, like the collar ties and the, the chimney that's deteriorating. Um, so um, each phase, we're knocking out the things that are the most urgent. Um, and uh, the last one was, you know, so if this funding is granted, then that would be in 2023, it'd be three years after we asked the first time. And I... I mean, I would love it if we could just do it all at once, but, you know, this is part of the, part of why like historic buildings, you know, why the, why this whole act is so helpful because uh, nonprofits can't afford to, to spend hundreds of thousands on, on brick, on the, the uh, maintaining uh, the exteriors of the buildings. And I mean, the, the good thing is that exterior, once it's done, like this is not something that you're, once, once this stone is replaced, um, I'm guessing it'll be good for another hundred years. Uh, but uh, yeah, so if you, um, so, so yeah, I, I believe the number she gave me for the, the final exterior phase was in the range of 85,000, um, if that helps any. Well, the more context I have, the, you know, the, sure. the yeah, so, all right, thank you. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, this may have been something that was discussed uh, three years ago when the initial application was made. But what about um, for all this public support for the building, making allowing public access to the beautiful little garden uh, to the uh, east of the building? Is that something that has come up in the past? Uh, Is that something that has been part of the plan? I don't think we, we don't have a garden. Um, I'm not sure what yard. Um, yeah, yeah we, we, we do have a small garden there. You're correct, Jonah. Um, oh. To be quite honest, um, I am very new. I was just recently elected, so I don't have all the wherewithal of knowing what was used before. Um, there's a lot that can be used with the building um, and our in, in, in our imaginings we could have the building be open to public to use in, in in many different ways but in the current plan what we're trying to just do is to fix the major problems um but there is we you know if i can continue to be in this role um as the elector i mean obviously i would like to see this building being used in some capacity where the public could use it but of course I need to continue in this role and I need to be able to have different things to say, but I do definitely think it would be nice because you're right. There is a very beautiful little garden next to it. That's quite lovely. Sorry. I, sorry. I wasn't sure what you were talking about. I go in and I go out and I, I guess I don't spend time in that garden, but um, yeah. I mean, the, the other thing is I, I would love the building at some point to be something that could be, you know, more accessible to the public. And uh, but there's, the interior, the, the public does come into part that, that where people come and go to get their mortgages. Uh, it's it's just a vault and, and a counter that looks kind of like a Harry Potter Gringotts bank like that. Um, but uh, but uh, yeah, the garden, I 
that's we can talk about that like i don't know if if that could be you know made I don't know, is it locked maybe, or what's what's the status of it right now? Yeah, my understanding is it's locked, and I know that you've taken proposals and perhaps offered the space for art installations in the past. Um, I remember there was one that we adjudicated on the Arts Council several years ago, huh. uh, but, you know, it, it's in a beautiful spot in the middle of downtown, and nobody uses it for anything, and it would be a, an incredible little urban pocket park that could be hmm. locked and maintained by some, you know, collaboration between you guys and the city. Again, uh, this quite be, could be quite complicated, but but I always find it sad that it that it's unused. And, I, and you know, Jonah, especially with this building being made when so I, much more beautiful. Yeah, when I was first looking to be on this in this position, I would go by that building and I'd be like, well, first of all, I was also I was the fortunate of being in Ada Comstock Scholar at, at Smith College. So I was always intrigued by it, which is what got me intrigued to be in the position. It's like all the different steps that get you somewhere. And I always looked at that Greenway area, that garden, and it's quite beautiful. And it, I agree with you. So I am not saying no to any of that. It's just I think that we have to work along with our rules around the trustees and the will and to figure out what we can or can't do. But I am definitely in support of doing something that would bring especially bring some sort of acknowledgement to the building because as i've said before it's quite nondescript you don't really notice it most people don't notice it it's just there and unless you're actually looking for it, you don't necessarily see it but it's a very beautiful building well i appreciate you bringing it up I'll, i'm going to bring it up at our next meeting and, and ask you know what what the status is and what we can do about it because it wasn't uh wasn't on my radar so thank you for bringing it up Well, it's my understanding, uh, Carol and Mimi, that you got the 80,000 Mass Historic Association grant a few years ago for the sort of phase one, and you're applying for another 50,000 for the second phase. Are there other, any other, or have you done your due diligence in looking at other potential funding sources? Well, um, in terms of historic preservation, these are the only ones that I'm aware of for this type of work. Um, I can I can ask others if they are aware of it. Um, we uh, because it had been something that uh, had been contemplated as phases all along. We've been going back to this the the people that uh, that were initially supported the study. Um, yeah, I don't. I'm not aware of other. Uh, historic grants that we could apply for if um, I, I can I can ask if other people are aware um, when I've seen other historic projects these are the the main ones that people have applied for um, so uh, yeah I'm I would certainly encourage you to perhaps do a little more research to see if there are other funding organizations out there and I don't know if Sarah if you could help with that uh, that would be great. So, um, using the city as a re regarding funding, also the mass mass preservation projects fund is incredibly competitive. What are your plans if that state funding doesn't come through? We would not be able to complete all phases of the work, and um, phase the next phase would be more costly and would would include work that carried over from this phase. So we we will never exceed the budget but we would like to be able to accomplish as much as we can and build the scaffolding once and um but uh yeah you can only you can only spend what you're granted um I, i'm hoping that they would look favorably on this um they did fund the initial study and then they did fund the fifty thousand, and then they they came back and even though we asked for 85 and and we would do the same thing, even though I'm I'm projecting um, 50, um, because that's if you look at the link that I provided in the responses to the questions, 50s, um, almost every single project, the most they got was 50 in the initial uh, funding cycle, uh, but because we asked for more than that, they did give us more uh, at the end. So um, I'm hopeful that they funded us twice, and the second time they funded us you know, twice in the same round. So I think they realize that it's really a critical historical building. And um, 
there's just no cheap way to do this, this, this masonry work. It's just um, when you're replacing, uh, you know, when you're replacing roofs and chimneys and, and uh, collar ties and all of these things, you have to have the people who really know how to do the work within the proper historic restoration. And so the, comp the, the company that we are hiring does that, they're, they're experts, but there's just no cheap way to do it. So I don't think that they would intend to start a project and then kind of stop supporting us in the middle. At least I, I hope they wouldn't take that viewpoint. Um, but uh, but if they do, then we'll just do we'll we'll just do as much of the most critical work that we can do. Thank you, Carol. Any other yeah. questions for Carol or Mimi? Oh, Mimi. Sorry. I just want to add that, you know, while we are the, the purpose of our role, the, the purpose of the Smith Charities is to provide um, monies to people from circumstances, you know, so, so we are trying to help like widows with children, new brides, tradespeople with helping to pay for them, uh, with their schools, with nurses. So we, our goal is to be able to take the benefits of whatever monies we get to give out to people of lower incomes to help kind of uplift them. So our goal is not to be an entity that is saving money to fix up the building as well. So we are seeking the support of, you know, the, the community to continue this building that still exists in, in effort of the continued of the mission of what the charity is, which is that we are actually doing a service for people and we're trying you know, we are we're working on trying to increase the amount of the gifts. We're trying to work continuously on outreach so people know we exist. But the goal of 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 the Oliver Smith will was to try and reach out to people of lesser means to try and lift them up. So it is it would be very difficult to have to take money from what we would hope to give to people who are in need. To, to you know, if there is a way to continue to use it where we can use the community funds as taxpayers as we pay in Northampton towards this building to fix it, means that we don't have to take money out of the hands of people in need from all the other nine towns, including Northampton, but also the nine towns, and the fact that we also fund money to the Smith Vocational School. So I guess all I'm saying is that. I understand all the questions that are being raised and questioned about the building, but we are a we are a charity that only does not have significant funds. We we have a, a, a certain amount of an endowment, but we don't have significant funds to be able to do too much. And we are trying to do our best to minimize our outside costs so that the services that we do provide can be done to not only support the Smith Vocational School. Um, which is what we is a, is a big part of it, but also just anyone between Northampton and all the other nine towns in the charity aspect of what Oliver Smith had meant to do. So we are seeking the support in order to make sure that the funds that we receive in other ways to be used for people in need. And so that's I, I just want to put that out there. Like we are we are not an organization that is out there trying to. You know, <laughs> we, are, we are trying to do our very best to help people in our communities that are in need. And I just wanted to point that out again, because it's we don't have unlimited funds to do that either. And we are doing our very best to try and support people. In fact, this year we have done our best to try and increase the gifts that we give people in connection to the fact that the cost of living is rising. So we are. Um, you know, we, we are we are a small charity, small, small organization, and we have this building that is historical that has been here. It, the gentleman that created this whole thing started the Smith Vocational School. His niece was Sophia Smith, who started Smith College. We are just trying to keep this historic building up in so that it's, it is a place for Northampton. So I just wanted to point that out again, because there are a lot of, I know you have a lot of pressing and different things that are there, but it's, this is, it, we would not have Smith Vocational High School without Oliver Smith. 
And this building is because of Oliver Smith. And I just want to emphasize that because Smith Vocational High School is a phenomenon. It is it is a bright, torchlight, fancy thing that we have in this city to offer to students. And I just want to emphasize that it would be very appreciative of funds to help support the building for that that started you know that of oliver smith so i'm, I'm putting I, that out and I, and <laughs> i just, just, just want to say it because i i i do appreciate the work you do but i really want to emphasize the fact that the charity is not as big as it seems to you know it's not it doesn't have the same kind of funding and we really want to be able to put our funds towards the people who need it as opposed to the, the other thing i just want to mention is it's actually you know northampton's historic downtown this is one of the prime buildings that helped get that designation as a historic downtown. It's, you know, it's got state recognition. And so I also see it as um, it's helping the town. Like you, you want to keep these beautiful old buildings from falling apart. And so, you know, it's, I think it's, it's in the town's interest to, to preserve any building in the downtown that is really, you know, part of the, the hub, the historic hub that makes people want to come to the downtown. Um, I also, while while Mimi was was talking, I um I looked up the information um, that that might answer your question a little better, uh, Mr. Hellman, um, about um, so when I asked the architects, I said, so would this finish the entire exterior? And they and here's um, what her email said. She said, no, the work would not be all done. The proposal was for second phase. Uh, now she said of three or four, but she says three and four can be combined. So I don't, I don't want to come back, you know, again for, so, so the project would, was for second phase of a three or four phase project. This phase includes the east elevation and the reconstruction of the chimney and structural framing modifications in the attic. The first phase already completed was the most complicated and addressed the parapet and the front or south elevation. The remaining work um is um this is the next phase the remaining work for a third um or third and fourth is the east and north elevations those two sides are not complicated considerably less expensive and they can be completed in a single project each elevation requires setting up a scaffolding system to complete the work safely we would want to do all of the elevations work in one phase rather than a part part in order to use the scaffolding efficiently and not have to pay to bring it back. So I, I hope that answers your question a little better. And if you, if you'd like me to send you that excerpt, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, that's well helpful. If you could just forward that to Sarah, that'd be great. Thanks. Sure, sure. Thank you, Carol, and thank you, uh, Mimi. Any other questions for uh, Smith Charities? Okay, once again, a reminder that public comment is November the 16th. And welcome to get asked supporters to attend that at seven o'clock. Thank you. Thank, and thank you. thank you for your support in the past and thank you for taking all the time to uh, to pour over all these projects. They all seem worthy. Have a good thank evening. Thank you. So moving right along to the electrical upgrades at the DAR house. Speaking to that will be Denise, is that right? Correct. Hi, how are you? Good. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight and giving me an opportunity to speak. Uh, unlike the other groups that have come before you tonight, I have to tell you that the DAR has been a very independent um, organization over the years uh, when we bought the the home uh, um, uh, the Claff House in 1926. We bought it and we paid for it very soon after. We, we typically have paid for things of, as we've gone along. And so asking for grants is a very new thing for us. W one other time, I realized 14 years ago, um, someone that's no longer with our group had come forward and asked for um, a small amount of money to do some work for the windows, and that was done. And however, this is, this is a new way for us to, as an organization, look at what we have and what we need to do. 
we have already re, um, redone parts of most of the, the roofing. Everything is sound. We've repainted the exterior, the interior. We've redone um, kitchens and, and bathrooms, heating systems. All of those kinds of things are all updated and in really good shape. So um, as a new regent, um, I um, am representing the Betty Allen DR. And if I can share my screen with you, I will do that. Okay, are you able to uh, to see that? Uh, no, we're not. We're not seeing anything yet, uh, Denise. Okay, um, let me try one other thing here. Sarah, is that something you're able to help with? Uh, Denise, when you go to share, yeah, there you go. I was going to say, make sure you hit the the right okay, screen on the little monitor. All right, there it is. Are you seeing it now? You see your it does not look like not the firehouse, house, but yes. Okay, what I what I have for you to look at is the uh, picture of the clubhouse you know, on a PowerPoint. Is, are you seeing that? I think you need to click on that PowerPoint. Click there where you're. Yep. If you can go back and click on that to open up that file, we're seeing you're seeing your desktop flowers. with all the sunflower cities. Are you still there, Denise? Yes, I am. Can, can you click on the icon in the middle of the sunflowers there? Are you seeing that? Yes. Yeah, click on that, how about? Or double click on that. Okay, that's what I've got open here. I'm so sorry. I'm gonna do a new share and see. Yeah, when you do share, it should give you a bunch of uh, there you go. Oh, there we go. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Um, okay. So this, this is, um, I'm representing obviously the uh, Betty Allen DAR and our preservation uh, project is the clap house at what 48 South street. No doubt. Many of you have gone past that through um, route 10 going out to East Hampton. Um, it's right on, on the road. So it's, it's very noticeable. So as I mentioned, there's a lot that we've done. Um, so recently I became the regent and we decided as a group that we're going to try doing things in a little more organized way, understanding that we we have to move beyond just saving our pennies and paying for things that need to be done. And so we asked um, the Pioneer Valley Inspections um, to, to conduct a home inspection for us. And uh, yes, they came back with 109 pages of things that, that we needed to be aware of in this house. And at first it was a very overwhelming and uh, speaking to different experts in the area, we we came to the conclusion Conclusion, that most of the things that were in this report were very minor things, pointing of chimneys and flashing, um, some gutters that need to be replaced, a few windows that were cracked, some that need to be replaced. Um, so the vast majority of the work um, is minor. Um, we're concerned about our um, energy and um, energy preservation. We have in the past done a, a mass save uh, project and part of the house, of course, it has been um, done with, with insulation. However, um, the priority that emerged from all of this 109 pages was we urgently need to update the electrical system. And we need to do that um, for safety reasons. And in addition to the safety hazards, it's not up to code. Um, it would Im improve that, it would be, it'd be safer. Um, but also um, it would allow us to proceed with other projects after that's done, such as completing the energy um, updates. We had Mass Safe come and do a recent energy audit as well. Um, and they gave us a fabulous contract that only would cost about $2,000 once we have the knob and tube um, taken out and certified that it is no longer active and it is all gone, um, then they will proceed with um, 
continuing um, the rest of the installation and updating the installation that we have for the house. And, and then of course our windows. So those are the three things in the next couple of years we're looking at. Um, we're not looking at massive multi million dollar things. We, we think that the electrical is, is well worth doing and important to do now. And we look to your help for a couple of reasons. Um, we did, um, I found out, um, apply to the DAR. And I'll talk a little bit about our, our arrangement with our national organization in a few moments. Um, but basically, they denied our grant um, uh, request for specifically for the electrical upgrades because they said specifically they will not fund um, electrical upgrades for preservation projects. Okay, so we started looking for other sources. Um, I um, we did apply to the Peabody um, Amelia Peabody grant, and the um, response from from that after it was reviewed was that. Our parent company of DAR National would have to, of course, assume, assume um, a role that um, the parent company said they're not willing to assume because we are independent um, as a chapter. And so we're not able to take um, advantage of that funding source. Um, the, we also went to um, Smith Vocational and were very, very excited that they said that they would be willing to take on the upgrading of the electrical system as a project in January of, of 2023. And therefore the funding that we were looking for was only going to be for originally uh, for materials. However, that's just fallen through. It fell through a week before um, the application to um, the uh, CPA app fund, funds were due. And so what I have here is the request for what was the largest bid that was deemed to cover 100% of what it would cost last year. This is last year's bid um, to achieve code compliance. Um, and so while it's represented as 100%, it's 100% of that bid. And we, we've talked about and understand, of course, that it was last year's bid. And there's probably going to be um, an additional inflation and that sort of thing. Um, and we're prepared to, to cover anything above that amount without even any additional fundraising. Um, we have sufficient funds to do that. It would put the windows a little bit later, um, but that's something that we can live with just fine if that's necessary. Um, we feel that it's a priority to do um, this knob and tube. And so, um, just to let us let you know, um, we have 44 members in our organization and, and an executive board. And um, these are all women that are from the Pioneer Valley that represent a lot of other organizations in the area. Um, Susan Samorowski was the founder of the Mary Lyons Foundation. Um, um, Pat Egan is a board manager on the, uh, the, the Friends of the Mount Holyoke range. Um, we have a number of people. Um, Sherry Brown is, is involved very strongly with the uh, historical Northampton Historical Society. So we have a lot of, of people that are involved with other organizations organizations. Um, some people that don't approve to have their pictures involved, so I apologize for that. Um, but we, we have a, um, a vibrant uh, executive board that is looking towards um, pursuing and continuing this um, upgrade. Um, why why are we doing this? I, th I think I thought it was very interesting when the question was asked, do we need to have the Betty Allen house? as we call it, but it's the clubhouse. Do we need to have that as our meeting place? And the answer to that is no, we don't. We absolutely don't. We can meet anywhere. We can go to the VFW and have our monthly meetings. Um, the reason for this house and for the preservation of this house is because it's part of our mission. This is what we do. And um, so we came to the conclusion that 
we don't need the clubhouse. The clubhouse needs us. Um, and since 1926, when we purchased the house, we've kept it in good repair. And this is just the biggest project that we've undertaken and one that we don't have sufficient funds to do so um, within, our, within our budget. That's why we're appealing to Northampton, to, to the CPA. We have been chartered, however, in Northampton since 1896. We've been around for a long time. And um, we are, of course, a, a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization and um, a very simple mission, three things with three pronged, historic preservation, education, and patriotism. That's our mission. And um, we accomplish that, first of all, through the historic property preservation. And so what we do and what is most important to us is to um, maintain in in good condition and for historical purposes this clap house um and the um there's a lot of history um that and i know it's it's late so i'm actually not going to I'm going to answer questions, but I'm not going to read everything that I had prepared. Um, but it's got a large history, and, and that information is um, is well documented um, through books and papers throughout the years. Um, and we are listed in the historical as a historical landmark, both in a state and in the um, national um, archives. And and also of most recent interest um, is that. There's a local woman by the name of Dr. Margaret Bruchak, who's doing research in the area. And all of this information is on the Historic Northampton webpage, by the way, um, not the Historic Society um, webpage. Um, this Dr. Bruchak has um, discovered that the Clap House was actually the place where the last of the Native Americans of Northampton resided and died. She is, her name is uh, Sally Mamathnish. Um, she's buried in the Northampton Bridge Cemetery. Um, and her gravestone is, is, is still in existence, even though she's Native American, because she was taken in um, in her later years by the Clapp family who resided in, in our DAR house. And, and she died there at age 88 and was given a family plot in the Northampton, um, Northampton's Bridge Street Cemetery and her gravestone is part of the Clapp family grave area. So we're very excited about this information. Um, and um, Dr. Bushnik is going to be speaking uh, on the 4th of November up at Smith College. Her research is, is um, up and coming and of great interest to all of us. And we intend to uh, make sure that this becomes a, a viable and vibrant part of our history now that it has been uncovered. And, and we think people in the area would find this interesting as well. Um, you have done a site visit and I thank you for doing that to see um, what you is pictured here. Um, clearly um, the knob and tube is there and needs to be replaced. And, and clearly it's a safety hazard and it would improve the building. Um, there's a number of different outlets, of course, um, that all are part of it. It's not just the knob and tube. Um, there's reverse polarity. There's open the junction boxes. Some are rent rusted. Um, the outlets, um, many of which are not grounded. Some of them, um, uh, they're, um, they all need to be part of this um, this upgrade. Um, there's loose wiring that that is is there. Um, the um, two prong outlets that are in existence are not grounded. There is a total lack of um, carbon monoxide detectors and smoke detectors. So this is a, a, a huge priority for all of these things to be replaced. Um, we have an amazing house here, and um, we are. We are very interested in preserving it. Um, it is open to the public. Um, we have open meetings every month, at least. That, that's the very least. Every month it's open and it's advertised. Um, we also have made it um, available to other 
organizations and now the COVID is open, we're hoping that those organizations are going to um, run space there. Um, the Sons of the American Revolution are looking for a home. There are other organizations like minded scouting organizations, um, boys, uh, the scouts as well as Girl Scouts. And uh, so we're looking to um, open those doors more now that, like I said, COVID is um, looks like it's on the wane. Um, so I'm going to, I can keep talking, but I, I think that it would be redundant. So please ask me questions and I'll be happy to answer them. And if there's something more you'd like to have me cover, please don't hesitate. Thank you, Denise. You can end your screen share there. So we can... Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Questions for Denise? Uh, refresh my memory. Why uh, Smith Folk pulled out and uh, there's no chance to get them back in the fold in, in for an, another semester in January? The reason cited to um, Sherry Brown was the uh, the person from our organization who's been dealing with them and had set it up with them. Um, the reason, among many reasons they cited was COVID concerns, that they did not want to bring the um, the students inside the house to work on this kind of a, a project um, at this time, that there were some concerns about that. Um, no, that doesn't mean it's over. I, I certainly have every intention of going back to them and asking if there's any level of support that they can give us. And that would help offset, I think, you know, some of the, um, what we expect to be overages. Thank you. And also I'm applying for other grants for other parts of the restoration, the windows and the installation, insulation. And so we have expectations that that is gonna come through, which would free up some of the money that we have in savings. Yeah. Yeah, this is a little bit of a follow up to Brian's question. And and why did can't the national organization pay for the repairs that you're looking to do? Oh, thank you for reminding me. Um, each <laughs> chapter of uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution is financially independent of natural national. It's kind of like a franchise. Um, there are parent company, um, but we have our own um, uh, 501c3. We have our, our own um, incorporation. Uh, so we're independent. Now, DER does provide funding for grants uh, for preservation nationwide. And, and because there's such a high demand for DER uh, preservation grants, they keep aside five of them, only five, for chapter houses every year. That's extremely competitive. And so they've limited the kinds of things that they will provide money for under that restoration. And we were told when we made application last year, sorry, we can't do electrical upgrades, but we will apply to them for other things that we hope to do in the future and with a very high likelihood of success. Thank you. Any other questions for Denise? Thank you so much for your presentation. And again, public comments is uh, slated for November the 16th at seven o'clock. So ask your supporters to show up then and be happy to happy to hear from them. Thank you so, so much. Again, you are welcome. Okay, last on the Applicants, and certainly not least, is the Community Investment Fund. Uh, Danny, is that you that will be speaking to that? Yes, hello. Okay. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, well, sorry to keep you after nine o'clock. Um, so this proposal came from kind of a, an idea. I'm a, I'm a small me and my partners are small real estate developers and investors in Northampton. Our, the name of our company is Pioneer Development. And um, we kind of, we got our start before we even started doing new construction. Uh, we got our start buying um, a couple of small multifamily homes in Northampton. And at the time, um, you know, 
we knew people who were trying to buy in Northampton and they even then were saying that it's a pretty unaffordable place to purchase a home. And we said, well, you know, I don't, I don't know, you know, like we bought a multifamily for at that time, it was $300,000. We were renting one of the units to an upstairs tenant. And so we were, you know, carrying the mortgage of the other half, which was, you know, about a hundred and it turned out, you know, after improvements and everything to, to be about $175,000 that we were carrying. And to us, that seemed pretty affordable. Um, yes, prices have gone up over time, but on the other hand, so have rents. Um, so, you know, it sort of kept, kept pace. And, and the reality is, is you can still purchase a small multifamily property. There's still, you know, as they say, naturally occurring affordable housing in the form of small multifamilies in Northampton. Um, where you can get a house for around 400,000, give or take a multifamily, and half of that would be 200, you know, so those are kind of similar to the numbers Megan was showing earlier of, you know, what a person at 60 to 80 percent of area media income can afford. Um, so, you know, this housing is out there. Um, we have noticed recently that there's been some outside pressures on the real estate market you know, from outside investors who are coming in and scooping up some of these properties and sort of over improving them, you know, from our vantage point, and then, you know, bringing the rents way up um, in, you know, to amounts that cater more to outside people moving into the area. Um, but, you know, the, the houses are there. And, um, and, and I wanted to say, I'm going to put two ideas together because this is sort of a combination of two ideas that that we've put in an application here for. Um, So the second idea, so so backing up a little bit, I also um, have worked uh, for a nonprofit economic development, um, nonprofit um, developer in in Springfield called Develop Springfield. And in the course of that work, I came into contact with an interesting idea called a community investment fund. And it can be used for a lot of different things. It's a very flexible financial tool, but essentially what it is, is uh, it takes advantage of philanthropic investors who uh, would like to see something good done with their money. So instead of like outright giving a subsidy for something like you get, you know, a certain amount of money to subsidize an affordable unit, for example, um, instead of that, you donate, you, you lend your money to a project at a very low interest rate and um, are kind of just preserving your capital. And in the course of doing that, you can get a social outcome, preserve your capital, and maybe from on the other side of the coin, I think, you know, be able to generate more money, you know, where somebody might be willing to donate $200, maybe they'd actually be willing to invest $2,000 if they knew that they could reaccess their money if they ever needed it in the future. So taking these two ideas together, um, we kind of we have been developing this idea for a while. We've been sort of incubating it, and um, we um, actually, you know, floated it by some city councilors that we um, that we met with after a neighborhood potluck, where we said, "Hey, we've been talking about this idea. What do you think?" They really liked it, and they encouraged us to apply for CPA and ARPA funds for the project. So it kind of took something that was a, a little bit of a back burner idea and brought it uh, way up. Um, But so the idea, and I'm sure you've read the application, um, is to kind of combine these two factors where we purchase in a pilot project, a a small multifamily home, a two family home, and we uh, find a suitable um, household to lease purchase the home, um, a household that's at 60 to 80% of the area median income to lease purchase the home over a three year period. Um, where they would undergo some trainings that are available already through Valley CDC and Wayfinders and also following sort of a mentorship model similar to um, what Habitat for Humanity also does. So a little bit of just having volunteers who are local landlords and that kind of thing um, and and homeowners to help, um, you know, to help as as things progress and train the the household over the course of a few years. And then at the end, um, they purchase the home and the lease purchase, you know, they're not paying any more than market rates. So it's not a typical lease purchase where you increase the lease price, the rental price. Um, in, instead, what we're doing is we're saying that the investors are community investors. 
Um, in this case, you know, this is going to, the pilot won't be, will be grant funded. Um, but the community investors, instead of taking like, you know, you could get returns between eight and 15% on small multifamilies, depending on what you got and what you're renting it for and the repairs and that kind of thing. But instead of taking those returns, um, just taking a very small amount of return between zero to 2% seems to be typical for these community investment funds. And the remainder of those, um, of the returns from the rental um, is basically put into a fund that becomes the down payment fund. Um, and to the extent that there's a little bit of a gap at the end, because we wanted to keep it to be a short program, not a long program, like a lot of the other lease purchase programs, which tend to be more in the 15 year range, um, we, we basically used a small appreciation uh, factor at sale to generate the remainder. So at sale, you know, it goes up a couple percentage a year to, to make up any gap that's needed between um, what's been accrued through the rental, um, the rental income and what's needed for the down payment. At the end of it, you sell it to, the, to that person who, you know, is a low income buyer of the home. And then the money goes back into the fund and you can do it again. Um, you can give people with the way community investment funds work is you can kind of give people terms, three or four year terms where they can you know, decide if they want to take their money out at the end or um, basically reinvest for another term. So that's the basic concept. And I'm happy, um, you know, I know a lot of people had presentations that involved slides. I think mine would probably be a spreadsheet, which may or may not be of interest, but it is the one that I submitted to you. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to go through numbers or just to kind of answer questions. Um, I think, I think maybe, maybe more, there's more to be gained in a little bit of dialogue back and forth. So maybe I should just open it up to questions and see if the spreadsheets come up naturally and I can share my screen if needed. Thank you, Danny. Uh, questions for Danny? Uh, I'll start off. So in terms of the uh, sources budget, you're looking at 400,000 from uh, ARPA. Is that correct? Yep, that is correct. And and when would you know about that? I believe that the decisions would be, you know, either at the end of the year or early next year for ARPA. And how optimistic are you about that because that's the bulk of your that's about four fifths or something of your funding, right? Right. Um, I'm optimistic that we could obtain some funding, probably based on you know the pool of things that got submitted. Um, I'm not sure you know that we'll get our that anybody is expecting to get their full request. I think any funding gaps that we have, you know, we're talking about budget adjustments um, and fundraising in comp in in combination. So additional probably like fundraising from private donors to make up the difference. And would that be fundraising or would that be looking for investments from private donors? Uh, it wouldn't, they wouldn't be donations, they would be investments. Is that correct? Um, I think it depends, you know, to in order to um, raise funds for a fund, you know, for the investors, there are some upfront costs. So if we were able to at least raise the uh, 20,000 or so in legal fees that we need, um, you know, to, in order to basically, you know, start the fund, uh, we could raise money that way. Or maybe we go through, you know, GoFundMe and some other uh, individual donations from, you know, private individuals just to do the pilot. So, it, it could go either way. I think ideally we get enough at least to start the investment fund and yeah, get private private investors. Thank you. Uh, someone had their hand up, right? Uh, Bev, was it you or are you just blocking out the screen there? <laughs> you are muted, Bev. Because there's there's no question there. Any any questions? Sure, I'll go. Um, Dan, it's, it's, uh, I'm not familiar with this concept. Um, I think it's a pretty 
intriguing one, particularly in uh, um, a community such as ours where um, affordability is just, you know, it, it, we're victims <laughs> of our own success here. Um, how far would I have to go? And I haven't done this at all, so I don't, I, 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 maybe it's an easy answer, but how far would I have to go to find another community where there's a model like this where we could look at it? There is, so what we put together is pieces of things that do exist in other places. Um, there, the Washington, in Washington, D.C., there is a, a similar concept that they're, they're kind of, they have a larger investor pool and a lot more money because it's D.C., and they're kind of going around trying to find large ap apartment complexes and win those on the open market. So similar concept. Uh, but then they have sort of an existing apartment complex and then they are um, deed restricting and running those as rentals. So it's a little different. It's not a home ownership concept. Um, so, you know, we there are funds that are doing similar things. There are definitely lease purchase programs that exist, mostly for single family and mostly in communities that are not yeah, doing as well um, as Northampton. So the, those, you know, land banks and lease, lease purchase programs tend to be running um, in other kinds of communities, but those those models do exist, you know, and of course, you know, Habitat for Humanity is a home ownership model that we've used a lot here as sort of a, a how is this done in one way. So we've kind of combined, you wouldn't have to look far to see a bunch of the inspirations, but to see like the, this exact idea, um, you know, I don't know of another program that's exactly, you know, doing this sort of thing and taking advantage of um, taking advantage of small multifamily housing um, to, to be able to make, make it work on a much faster timeline yeah. uh, to generate the down payment. And so follow up in a different direction. Um, I, I, I guess my understanding is, I don't know if it's articulated specifically, but at some point this is going to be self-sustaining or self-perpetuating. And okay. Um, do you expect that to be like right from the first go round that it's going to be, you know, generate enough revenue that you're going to be able to port right back in and just, you know. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. yeah. Okay. Oh, now that's, that's pretty cool. All right. Um, great. Thank you. Bev? Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> I did have my hand up before and I did lean on my keyboard and uh, black out my screen. So forgive me. Um, yeah, I have about a zillion questions, um, but the hour doesn't support that. Um, I, I personally think it's a very interesting idea. I think ideas like this um, have a lot to do with um, the management of the effort. Um, so can you talk a little bit about who, who would run this, how it would be staffed, and as a corollary question, because I think motives have to be sorted out as well. It's both an investment for some people and a, a benefit for others. Um, what are, are the recourse options that the investors might have should things not go well? Okay, um, so how it would be managed. So we are a small development organization and we have owned and operated a number of small multifamilies. So for the pilot project, and I, and I did send you an updated budget, but for the pilot project itself, we would run the pi pilot pro bono. And I did, I did value it in my second round. You know, the first round I didn't, because we did get the question from you, how is this possible that fund management doesn't cost anything? Well, it's possible because it's being donated. Um, by our company, you know, so, so, you know, that is going to, that's just the first go round, but then it is budgeted in after that, particularly if we start with grant seed funds um, that they kind of help generate some money at the beginning, but there's, you know, there's the 2%. Uh, we're talking with the, some people who may be capable, who are nonprofits, who may be capable and who are capable, definitely, and may be willing to manage the fund um, and be paid through fund pr proceeds. Um, we feel pretty strongly that we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So like a lot of the pieces are out there. I think what we would like to do is use the revenues from the program to pay the existing nonprofits that we have in this area um, who already have staff capacity um, to uh, run the different components and offer different things. Now, does that mean it doesn't ultimately need some kind of a home yeah, it will need a home. Um, you know, we'll need a nonprofit to hold the property because it it doesn't work if it gets taxed or it does work, but 
we would have to lengthen the lease purchase period by quite a bit. Um, you know, so so it definitely will need a home eventually, uh, whether that's an existing nonprofit or a nonprofit that we create, um, you know, is, is a big question. But I think that, like, to the extent that we can, we'll use the revenues generated by the fund to pay existing nonprofits to do the parts of the project that are needed. Uh, and that's sort of like a, um, both, both a short and a long term thing. And in the short term, as far as just like running the pro pilot project, we would do that, you know, in kind, essentially, um, and then in the long run, the, the model would fund it and it would get paid out to to existing organizations or to an organization that's created for the purpose. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, that provokes other questions about, you know, the sort of soft side of the experience. I, I think you're talking about, again, engaging nonprofits who have more experience with um, identifying and supporting people who are looking to become first-time home buyers. Um, re remind me, what is the uh, anticipated average rehab cost for these units? We budgeted 25,000. Um, it could be a lot less. It, it really depends on the house. Be a lot more, right? <laughs> it could be a lot more, but we wouldn't purchase a house that it would be a lot more for. Yep. That would be part of the purchase decision. You know, you have a pretty good sense when you walk into a place, when you've done as many projects as we have, that, you know, of, of what you're looking at to get it up and running. Also, some, I will note also that some of the things don't need to be done right away. Some of the things are critical for move-in, like lead remediation, I think is a good thing to do before any tenants get in, you know, rather than limit yourself to not having children in the house. Right. Um, but you know some things like boiler upgrades and that kind of thing you we could use the revenues from the program um and you know kind of go from there so it doesn't have to necessarily happen on day one so budgeting doesn't doesn't it doesn't all need to be accommodated you know right away yep and then um the the issue about sort of the the potential tension between the interests of the investors and the uh sustainability of the real estate and homes for people. Right. The market goes soft. The numbers are wrong. The rehab is more. Um, people don't pay their lease payments. Um, with enough regularity that it starts to weaken the fund, what happens? I mean, things can certainly go wrong, but real estate in Northampton is never a bad bet. So all these things are backed by properties that actually have value. You know, end of day, money can be recovered. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, and I don't want to dominate the conversation, this is more about the people who will be moving in there than it is about the investors. And so I understand there's a way for the investors to be whole. Uh, what do you see as the potential risks to people who have paid four years worth of lease payments and suddenly find? Well, they'll be paying, they'll be paying three years worth of the same rent that they would have paid if they were in rental housing. There's not going to be any increase. It's going to be the rents that they pay are going to be affordable to their income level. And that was like a really critical part of, of putting this together, that they're not paying. It's not a normal lease purchase where you pay more for an option to lease purchase. You're going to pay the same rent as you would have paid otherwise. You just need to fulfill the obligations of the program. And some people end of day, are not going to, and then they will not be any worse off than they would have been if they had just rented a regular unit for that time. So the accumulated um, down payment capital that they then have when they exercise the right to purchase is funded by the sacrificed return by the investors. Exactly. Yeah. And any grant funds or any funds that the, the, the right. fund itself owns. Mm -hmm. that, that gets to a, a mechanism for allowing legally use of CPA funds for this type of project, which is which is a really interesting and unique idea, but was having a hard time finding a CPA box. Um, Danny, is there a way that you could structure it so that the CPA funds would be used to pay a, whatever organization it is, would it be a nonprofit that's to be created or uh, an existing nonprofit, the difference between that market rate rent and the subsidized rent that you're planning to charge? Uh, 
we're not, that's not how it's structured. We're not planning. So we're kind of planning to be charging rents that are, they are market rate, but they're naturally affordable. Like there's plenty of apartments in Northampton that still rent for $1,200 to $1,500 a month. So because we're utilizing naturally affordable housing stock, existing housing stock that is on the market, it's already naturally affordable to people at 80%, 68% of the area median income. Like there isn't, there isn't necessarily a difference between the rent we're charging and what would be an affordable rate. Does that make sense? It, it does in a way. Although, you know, three years out from the purchase of a home, that could be a lot different than the funding picture you were looking at when it was acquired. I mean, yeah, and certainly you could always charge more and say, well, this isn't really market rate. There is, a, in fact, a gap, but the program isn't planning to charge as much as it possibly can for rent. It's planning to just carry the, the property and chart and charge rent that's sort of in the middle of the pile and is affordable to a, the, the buyer at the income level that we're targeting. So will the, the rent be established by the price of the home or by the affordability of someone with the particular AMI that you're targeting? Exactly, this, the latter. It will be, the rent will be established based on the lease purchaser's income level. And if we need to adjust the rent of the other unit in the property a little bit accordingly to make it work, we can do that. I don't know that that will be necessary or not, but I don't think it would be a big adjustment. You know, most of the properties should work, but maybe, but it may be that the other unit is a little bit more in order to make it work for the for the lease purchaser. It's, it's it hits a funny area because it's not direct assistance to the renter, right? It, well, like you'd ask if it could be a donation, and and it can't. It, you know, it can't. We can't use municipal funding to be a donation. Right. So maybe it could be structured in a way, I hear what you're saying. So maybe it could be structured in a way that it was kind of structured as direct assistance to like a difference between a market rate and a lower rate to, to the renter. So that's possible that we could like look at that. Um, I mean, I guess the other thing is that we had this meeting with these city councilors and they suggested that if it wasn't being given as a don't as a grant, if it was being given as a loan, that maybe some of the rules had been relaxed in the past as far as um, you know, deed restrictions and the other you know, programmatic requirements that you often have. It, it's the acquisition that's the trigger. You know, if an organization like incidentally holds title to a piece of property, um, mm -hmm. that can be looked at a little bit differently. But if a nonprofit is intended to hold a property in the long term and CPA funds are directly being used for acquisition of the property, the law is really clear that an affordability restriction is required in that instance. Even if it's a loan. Yeah. And could it be, I answered the question um, that you sent about that. Could it just go towards like soft costs and operating costs of the property and that kind of thing rather than the acquisition? Maybe with, but you know, we need additional details. Okay. Yeah, I, I kind of punched out in that email and that, you know, uh, response, like some of the other costs, you know, the soft costs that are not directly acquisition, there's operating costs. And then there's also, you know, the other creative way I posed that we might do this, although I, I sent a question to my accountant and I didn't get the clearest answer back about it, is that, you know, by valuing the pro bono donation of managing the program, could we take that, you know, as a payment and then turn around and, you know, pay it for acquisition? I'm not sure if that will work out from a tax standpoint or not, but it is a, an interesting idea that, you know, maybe could allow CPA funds to be used toward this. If that makes sense. It, it does. It, it might not be tenable, uh, but, but the idea certainly makes sense. Sarah, I'm detecting some um, hesitation on your part over whether this is even allowable use of CPA funds. Is that is that correct? I mean, it, it, the intent of it is certainly allowable for CPA, but it, the devil will certainly be in the details with this one. And it, it, some of those details just 
aren't available, it doesn't sound like at this stage of the project development. Well, I, so, I have a, a list of the soft costs, which I sense, I'm trying to find that here, you know, which basically, if you just add them all up, they get pretty close to the ask, you know. Um, so for example, I'm just gonna read this off of my answers, but you know, repairs and improvements budget, I don't know if that's allowable, but that's up to 25,000. Closing costs at purchase and sale, that's about 5,000 because we're gonna have our legal fees donated. Um, we've got reserves in the event that a major repair were to be needed, some other soft costs. Um, then there's just kind of operating costs for the building. We could put it towards, you know, uh, property taxes, insurance, utilities, repairs, maintenance, that kind of thing. So, I mean, if you start to add that up, that's 34,000 alone. So if you add that up, that gets pretty close to the, to the ask um, without even doing anything complicated with, you know, the donated um, services. Um. Dan, uh, Danny, to, to your knowledge, have have any other CPCs in the state funded something like this? Or I'll throw that to Sarah as well. I mean, this is very, very unique for us. We've never done anything as a loan before. It's always it, it, and and so there's there's a lot of confusion on our part as to the how this would work out. Sarah, do you know if anybody else throughout the state has done something like this? I I did look. I couldn't find one because this is sort. It's a it, it's a pulling together of a lot of different programmatic themes. Um, so you, there may be one aspect of it that has been funded in another community and even in Northampton, like the, the Valley CDC direct assistance program it has some elements of this, but not a community investment fund in particular. And, and just to be clear, we asked for it as a loan because we thought based on this meeting that we had had that, that somehow got around some of the requirements um, that you would have been under for, you know, deed restriction and that kind of thing. You know, we would take it as a grant if we, if that was a possibility and then just flip it into the fund at the end and it would become seed funding for the fund in the same way we've structured the ARPA request. Um, so, you know, if that's also a possibility, but a loan is fine as well. Um, and that would get us through the pilot project and help kind of raise funds, you know, additional funds towards the actual community investment fund. And Sarah, a loan, a, a loan is allowable? Uh, loans are allowable, yes. Uh, like the Valley CDC um, direct mortgage assistance program is, is a loan or, or at least it, it could be depending on what happens at the end of it. Uh, but there's, there's no prohibition against using CPA for loans. Other questions for Dan? Well, thank you for sticking with us on this Wednesday evening. And again, uh, public comments on November the 16th. So you're welcome to get interested folks to come to our meeting at that, at that time. Thank you. All right, so thank you. Uh, just a couple of things. So remembering that our next meeting is uh, November the 2nd, where we will be hearing from, uh, I think, all from the city, correct? From the five or is it six city projects that are coming before us? Uh, so that will be entirely, is that is that right, Sarah? Yes, the city so, those were all uh, municipal projects. Okay. So Carolyn will be here for an extended amount of time. Carolyn, will, we will get to know Carolyn well in those, with those, uh, five or is it six? Five projects, right? Uh, five, because one was funded through the expedited process. Right, correct. Um, we've already welcomed our new members. Really, the last item is that it's that time to elect a chair and a uh, and a vice chair. I have been your chair for. Um, quite some time and I am happy to relinquish that role if other people are interested. I do not want to take that opportunity away from anyone. While I um, honor the position, I also honor the other people who um, would like to assume that position. 
Um, we need a we 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 need a new vice chair. Uh, we lost that in Linda. Uh, so uh, at the very least, well, we need to elect both a chair and a and a vice chair. Um, and the role for those either wondering the role of the vice chair is uh, um, to facilitate meetings when the chair is unable to do that. And I'm not sure that there is any other role, Sarah, that the vice chair has. Is that right? It's, that, it's it, that, that's really that's the crux of it, really. Yeah. And the role of the chair mainly is to facilitate the meetings and keep in contact with Sarah and um, and, and all of that stuff. Uh, so I've forgotten, Sarah. How how do we do this? And and I'm I'm happy to um, to to uh, take myself out of the meeting if that would be useful for people. And I don't need to need to be here if people want to talk um, to discuss. My role might be easier with me not here. So I'm happy to to leave the meeting and then leave the election of the vice chair to you. Whatever. If people would feel more comfortable with that, I'm happy to do that. It's a little awkward. <laughs> um, Sarah, how, how should we proceed with this? I'm up to the committee, really. It's in the past, it's been a motion second discussion, uh, either for uh, a chair separately and then vice chair or the two combined. Brian, are you willing to continue serving as chair? I am happy to, I am honored to do that, yes. Then I nominate Brian for uh, for chair. Second. I second that. Okay. <laughs> I vote for that. <laughs> Sarah, do we want to? Okay. Any any more any discussion? Any any discussion on that? Again, I'm. I'm, I'm any other nominees? To, I believe it was Jeff that was on the front page of the paper today. Jeff, was that you? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. But so, that, has, that has no bearing on this, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Get the front page and look in the top left corner, and there's Jeff, um, surrounded by, by police officers, I believe, but in a in a good way. In a friendly way, yes. In a friendly. Way. All right, so Sarah, you want to take us through a roll call? Is that what we do? Sure. Uh, Chris. Aye. Jonah. Thumbs up. Okay. Uh, Bev? Aye. Jana? Yes. Julia? Absolutely. Jen? Yes, enthusiastically. Yeah. <laughs> and Brian? I will abstain. Okay. So we do need, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I, and I so value the work that um, all of us do uh, in, the, in the community and the good things that, that, that we are able to accomplish, sometimes contentiously, but always uh so we need a vice chair is anyone interested in that and i think with all due respect we would take bev and jonah out of that out of the running for that no disrespect for the two of you but be awkward your first meeting to, um is anybody interested in in doing that um we Brian, need a vice many, Brian, how many meetings have you missed during your tenure as chair, that might help. No, har hardly any. Yeah. So, um, so you don't have to do much. <laughs> All right, come on. Who's been here? Who has been here the longest? Is it Julia? Are, are you are you telling the truth there? Um, I think I came when Chris came. Uh, Julia and, and Jeff, you've been here for a while, Jeff, Julia, uh, Chris. Julie, Julia and Chris were on before I was. <laughs> okay, uh, Ju uh, either Julia or Chris, either of you, are you in interested, willing? I, I think I, I got to be honest, I think I have a travel schedule that would not, the possibility of me missing some meetings coming up is is pretty distinct right now. So, okay, so I think I got it. Taking yourself out of it. Yeah. Um, Chris. All right, but only if I can use the Linda Morley caveat. Yeah. It's, it's vice chair and vice chair only. Um, or co-chair or co-chair only. Uh, so I'm hearing that Chris is willing to accept the position of vice chair. Uh, is there a motion to that effect? 
So moved. moved to nominate Chris. Karen was a yeah, uh, so moved. I think Jeff was a second. Any discussion? Sarah? Right. Jonah? Yes. All right. Bev? Yes. Jana? Yes. Thank you, Chris. Julia? Yes. Jen? Yes. Thank you, Chris. You and Brian for both. Yes. Here. Yes. Thank you. Oh, I suppose uh, you call Brian? Yes. And Chris? Stain. So once again, uh, welcome to our two new members, Bev and Jonah. Um, generally, we don't go quite so long, but with how many applicants we have, um, this is this is our long meeting, and we'll have another long one in two weeks. So thank you so much um, for the uh, being on the committee, and it's a great committee to be on. And we will see all of you in two weeks, unless there's other business not foreseen when the agenda was published. Yeah, I have a really quickie one. Uh, everyone should go to Laurel Park this Saturday and look at the signs and celebrate Laurel Park. Great. And what time is that? Is there a, a specific is, event? Sent, is it all day? I sent an email. It's a, a good like chunk. nine to five or something, right? Yeah, it's a it's a long day. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, motion to adjourn. Somebody. So moved. Yeah, second. Yeah, here we go. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night.